Now, as I said earlier, everybody knows the Scarlet Letter pretty well, um, but many people sort of underappreciate it. Uh, I, I hate to sort of break uh, everyone's image of Hawthorne or burst their bubble. I know we all took Mrs. McGillicuddy's 11th grade English class, and in that class we were told that The Scarlet Letter was a great novel because it taught us about how wicked it is to do anything inappropriate sexually. Well, I mean, I guess that's probably part of the message of the novel. There's no question of that. One shouldn't go around committing adultery with one's minister. Uh, leads to some pretty bad consequences. We know that. But, you know, I, I sort of hate the way that The Scarlet Letter is packaged by some high school English teachers because they really sort of miss the big point of it. Remember I was talking about the fact that, that – Hawthorne was really kind of working within certain conventions. You know, there's the Gothic tradition, which we talked about last time, and then there's the sentimental seduction novel tradition, and all of the kinds of things that go along with it. Well, The Scarlet Letter is a wonderful novel, not simply because it deals with uh, American history, and people like to teach it because of that, not because it just tells people don't be naughty, which it does, um, but also because remember the, the, the sort of formulaic sentimental seduction tradition. There's the, there's the good girl, the bad girl, all of this kind of stuff, the will she, won't she, will she, won't she, uh-oh, she did, and now there are the consequences. And one of the things that happens to the bad girl in the novel of sentimental and seduction tradition is that she ends up in her final chapter either dying in childbirth, repenting of her terrible uh, fornication, or giving up the child for adoption and then going off to a nunnery to live the rest of her life serving the poor and repenting of her terrible, terrible sin. The major or the officer who seduced her uh, either drinks himself to death or commits suicide or something horrible happens to him and so on and so forth. Well, what, uh, and of course the girl who's the naughty girl almost always has dark hair and all of these kinds of things. Well, what's so wonderful about The Scarlet Letter is A, the action of the novel begins after all of the adultery has taken place. I mean, it starts after the sex, uh, and it still manages to be a really interesting and engaging novel. Uh, it's about scandal, there's no question, but at the same time, it begins where most of the sentimental sen uh, seduction novels are starting to wrap up with the consequences. So there's an innovation right there that's kind of interesting. But the big, big innovation is this, is that Hester Prynne, when she has her child, does not give the child up, does not die in childbirth. Oh, she goes on to a life of virtue, no question about it. She's one of the most interesting and admired people in the, uh, in the village by the time all of this ends, by the time she becomes more mature, everyone considers her to be practically a saint in the village. But she keeps her child, and she raises her child, and she, in, in, in most importantly, remains discreet about who the father is. She's not going to reveal who it is. He's going to have to do that himself. And he does it in this vainglorious way, going out in some sort of blaze of glory. Uh, Dimsdale is really a, a, a pathetic figure in many respects. It's Hester who's the strong figure. It's Hester who ends up uh, being the good person. And although the village thinks that it's punishing her for her adultery, by the time she becomes more mature, by the time they have a chance to kind of think about what they have inflicted upon her as a punishment, she's able to flip that around and use that scarlet A on her chest as a badge of honor, as something that is uh, reminds the villagers of how harsh their punishment was. One of the great themes, of course, of the novel is that people's private sins shouldn't be made public business, that it's, that it's wrong to do that that it's an invasion, the sanctity of the human heart, as, as Hawthorne says, has to be respected. And what the villagers did was really wrong in having brought her up on the scaffold and said, we demand to see your private sin. You know, in Young Goodman Brown, if you've ever read that short story, if you, if you get a chance, you really should. If you've not, um, this is the thing that the devil in the end of the story uh, says that he wants them all to go out and do. Go out and seek out all the private sins of other people and make them public. So in other words, the thing that the devil in that short story says uh, is the greatest, uh, the, the 
coolest sin you can commit, from his perspective, is to go and expose other people's flaws, failures, and sins. Drag it out into the sunlight. Make a big deal out of it. Talk about it, right? Um, and so, and the reason for that is that it's destructive to human civilization to do that, to society to do that. Well, um, so much for the Scarlet Letter and why I think it's so incredibly innovative. What we find when we deal with Hawthorne's fiction, we talked about the preface to the Scarlet Letter earlier, is that his prefaces themselves are very, very important. He does this with the Blythdale Romance, the Marble Fawn to a lesser extent, but this preface is probably the most important and most significant to literary theory. Um, and, and Henry James and many other writers later would, would make a big deal out of it. The most important thing that he talks about in this is he puts forward a theory of the romance as a subgenre of fiction. Now, you're going to hear me and probably other people refer to this as a novel over and over and over again, but technically speaking, that's wrong of me to do because Hawthorne is actually saying this is not a novel, this is a romance, and they are different. And he makes the case in this preference, um, preface for there being a difference between the novel and and the romance. And he says, the author can claim, uh, can claim a certain latitude, both as to fashion and material, which he would not have felt himself entitled to assume had he professed to be writing a novel. So he says, I'm writing a romance, I'm not writing a novel, because of that you need to give me a certain amount of latitude, both with respect to the fashion, which is the way I write, and the material, that is my subject matter, which normally if I were writing a novel, you would not you would not uh, allow me to do, because novels were involve greater uh, fidelity. He says the latter form of composition is, is presumed to aim at a, a very minute fidelity, not merely to the possible, but to the probable and ordinary course of man's experience. In other words, novels deal with the probable. They deal with what really happens. But the romance deals with the possible. And the former, he says, the romance, has fairly a right to present that truth under circumstances to a great extent of the writer's own choosing or creation. So in other words, I'm writing a romance, I'm not writing a novel. A novel requires you to be very much more, you know, real life, realistic. I, I don't know what Hawthorne would do with things like sci-fi or fantasy. I think he would put it under the category of romance because it's, it, it, it's not required to be realistic fiction the way he thinks a novel should be. But of course sci-fi and, 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 uh, and uh, fantasy hadn't really been invented by that time, so he probably would put it under that, that uh, category of romance, or being like romance at least. But a novel, he says, has to stick to this demand of verisimilitude. So he's wanting to move that away. If you'll notice towards the end of the preface, he talks about, he says, life is made up of marble and mud. He's looking for not total detachment from reality, but not an absolute fidelity to reality. People, he, he says, I'm looking for some sort of in-between thing. Remember that little discussion in the preface to the Scarlet Letter where he's talking about the different types of light and how his kids' toys in front of the, the fireplace are illuminated from both the moonlight and the firelight? He's looking for a blend. It's kind of a middle ground is what he's looking for here when he's talking about the romance. He wants to explore the possible. Now, one of the reasons was because fiction in the late 1800s, I mean, late 18th century and early 19th century, was highly distrusted. It was very much um, poo-pooed and uh, looked down upon. Uh, Thomas Jefferson thought it was trash and drivel. It would rot your mind to read novels and really shouldn't do that. Uh, it's a huge waste of your time uh, and intellect to do that. And so it, it had a kind of a low reputation, kind of on the order of comic books or something of that nature. But um, or, or maybe the way we look at, say, trash fiction today, uh, Jackie Collins kinds of novels and such. Uh, but Hawthorne is trying to build the case that, you know, th there can be art through this. It doesn't all have to be trashy fiction. And one of the things that he says that we need to get away from is the fact that the novel in the late 18th and early 19th century kept trying to grasp for credibility by saying, this is a true story, a real story. And yet, it would usually be a true story or a real story about something fantastic like, you know, this horrific um, case of, um, you know, somebody being abducted and, um, you know, spirited away by Native Americans or something like this. Or, for example, Moll Flanders, if you've ever read that, it's supposedly a true story of a woman who almost accidentally marries her brother um, and goes through all kinds of uh, bizarre uh, episodes. And so, uh, what was going on at the time was 
people were writing uh, fiction that was sensationalist, but they were trying to claim credibility by saying it really is based on a true story, fantastic as it may seem. Robinson Crusoe, for example, is a true story, supposedly, uh, based on an actual guy. That that much is true. And some of it is based on some very strange things that happened to that guy. So it was sensationalist, and but it kept trying to maintain verisimilitude. This is real. This is true. This is real life. The real life story of some crazy adventure of so and so and so and so. Now, Hawthorne is saying, look, we got to detach from that. We got to get away from that. Don't don't play on that ground. It, it is an imaginary. It is it is an art form that engages the imagination, and we need to be okay with that. On the other hand, though, we need to give the writer the license to draw broader moral truths broader spiritual truths, broader intellectual truths, through not requiring him to be tethered to absolute verisimilitude, absolute realistic sort of world that uh, that we live in, the everyday. He says, I'm trying to get to something bigger than that. So realize what he's trying to do in the preface. He's trying to make the case for a new type of fiction, and that's very ambitious of him, and something that you have not seen anybody else uh, in American literature certainly do up to this point.